right, everyone. It is 12 o'clock, so um, we will go ahead and get started. Um, if you will, just like I said earlier, if you don't mind, just muting your microphone. Um, uh, first, I want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is Women United's first virtual Lunch and Learn, Restoring Hope in the Road Ahead, What's Next for United Way? Um, I'm Mary Catherine Levy. I am the Director of Women United and Community Engagement at United Way of Greater Chattanooga. Um, we are thrilled to have each of you here with us today. Um, so I want to start off by thanking our panelists and our moderator for joining us in this conversation today. And also thank all of our committee members who are on the line. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're really excited to dive a little bit deeper into the Restore Hope Fund and shed light on efforts taken by the United Way and our nonprofit partners um, to address the needs of our community during this COVID-19 crisis. Um, what we're also going to do is we're going to touch on how the United Way works with nonprofits, individuals, and companies in our community uh, to also address the many needs that we face even before COVID-19 changed our whole entire world. Um, so today's Lunch and Learn is hosted by Women United. Now, for those of you learning about us for the first time, Women United is an affinity group of the United Way of Greater Chattanooga. Um, we work together to align resources to support United Way's work for education, health, and stability. Um, and our group is committed to helping entire families become stable and thrive through United Way's focus, uh, impact focus areas. Um, so part of what we do with Women United is we regularly host educational and networking events like this one. Obviously, most of the time we're doing them in person if we can, but with everything going on in the world, um, we decided to go virtual with all of this for now. Um, we also host volunteer opportunities for women to get involved in the community. A perfect example is over the last year, we, we worked directly with Tyner Middle, and we did a learn and serve series with some of the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade girls there where we brought in different leader, female leaders from throughout the community to come in and talk about uh, career paths and how they get involved in the community. And just trying to give the girls a little bit of more insight of um, what women can really do and how we can shed light on the world. Um, so just so you know, when the event is over, you all will receive an email from me with a bit more information uh, and also a survey regarding this event itself and any additional information you would like to see on events coming up in the future that we may host. Um, when you get that, please don't hesitate to reply to me. If you're just learning about Women United and you're interested in getting more involved, you can respond directly to that email to me. I'd be happy to have a conversation, sit down on a Zoom call or a phone call and kind of go over with you even more in depth about some of the work that we do. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our moderator, Kelly Ballard. Um, Kelly is the Director of Privacy at EPB, and she is the Secretary of our Women United Committee. Um, she'll be helping lead today's discussion with Tony Doily and Dominique Brandt. Um, so go ahead, take it away, Kelly. Always take that second to remember to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary Catherine. Uh, welcome you all. Very excited about um, what we're about to hear today. Like Mary Catherine said, I'll give you a little bit of information about myself and how I got started with um, Women United. I've been at EPB for 12 years now, and we've always, one of our biggest campaigns is always given to United uh, Way. So when um, Ms. Donna L. Um, asked me to join Women United, um, I did not um, hesitate. Um, the mission directly aligns with not only my personal views, but also along with my employer. So um, when the baton was passed on to um, Mary Catherine, we were, the board was asked to decide if we wanted to remain um, on the committee. And we all did, every last one of us did, that um, either started with Donna or either um, came in later. We, we stayed because we feel like this is um, um, not only a mission that's important, but a mission that's necessary for this area, unfortunately. Um, and that's me. So uh, let's start with Tony. If you can 
tell us a little bit about yourself and then um, why you are uh, passionate about United Way. All right, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony Doyley. I'm the Director of Workforce Engagement with the United Way of Greater Chattanooga. I've been here for a little over a year. Um, and prior to this, I served in uh, wealth management. So I have over 10 years of experience. I am a Series 7, Series 66 licensed uh, financial advisor. Um, and the reason why I made the shift was because I, I, I've always wanted to work in nonprofit um, and, and develop key relationships in the community. And I felt like this was a great opportunity for me to do that. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today and to be able to share with all of you. Thanks, Tony. And Dominique, same to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation, Kelly and Mary Catherine. It's a, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm two hours behind you guys in Colorado right now, um, but uh, great to, to spend a little time with all of you. Um, I am in my eighth month with uh, United Way. I was for before this for 12 years with Habitat for Humanity, both here and in my hometown of Miami, Florida. And I think the biggest reason that I looked at United Way really critically uh, for a work position was with Habitat, although I knew that I was making a really clear and direct impact, it was more limited and United Way with its ability to uh, convene a lot of organizations and individuals and really make collective impact in the community, that was just an opportunity to touch more people and really move the needle on some of the key indicators in our community that we know need to change. Thank you. Um, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I have some questions that I'll um, pass back and forth to our panelists here. And I just wanna remind everyone, um, especially if you've just joined us, to mute your device. And then also, if you have questions, um, we are going to attempt to <laughs> look at them as we go, go along. Um, so feel free to send them as you get them. And um, as you have them, and I'll read them off and try to get them answered um, as we go through. We'll also have a question and answer session towards the end if you wanted to um, save your questions at the end or had a late question that, that um, came up. So with that, we'll get started. And I'll start with you, Dominique. Um, we all know that COVID-19 placed a tremendous financial burden on many people in our community who lost wages. Can you tell us more about the Restore Hope Fund, how it came about, and how it has been supporting individual needs in the last few months? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Kelly. Um, so United Way, like many other organizations, went remote on March 16th, that Monday. And our first disbursement of the Restore Hope Fund was March 23rd. So we moved very, very quickly. Uh, Restore Hope came from a clear understanding that as different businesses shut down and workers were going remote, not everybody was going to be able to go remote. Uh, there were going to be a lot of frontline workers that were going to either be furloughed, laid off, or let out just lose their jobs for the foreseeable future. And that there was going to be a need for just basic uh, necessities, rent assistance, utility assistance, and things of that nature. So we really quickly stood up the Restore Hope Fund. Um, Leslie was able to secure a couple of um, startup uh, grants or donations and from there we put out the call and we've had amazing response from the community um, EPB and TVA along with um, lots of other corporate partners uh, made gifts uh, made challenge gifts matching gifts to the community so we had some really uh, successful uh, campaigns for along that line um, EPB did things on TV PSAs and billboards and so we put the word out really quickly uh, well, how we did it is we partnered with 13 agencies that were selected very intentionally and invited to be partners. So they were selected for the areas of the city and the county that they serve or for the demo and or for the demographic that they serve. So we wanted to make sure that we were putting the resources very closely in the community. So for example, uh, a family that lives in Alton Park might not necessarily think about going to uh, signal centers or the partnership um, or hope for the inner city for help but they'll think of going to the back so we looked at that kind of uh, 
geographic coverage. And then also the demographic coverage. We knew that many of the families that would be impacted would be Latinx families. So we made sure that we brought in a process that allowed those to apply through La Paz. And we're very intentional with this um, fund to remove every barrier possible and um, make it as simple and as easy for the agencies to work with us and for the individuals and the families to apply. So to date, we have served 486 households, which turns into 1,426 uh, men, women, and children, and to the tune of $326,700.18 which is really uh, quite amazing. We still have a little over $100,000 in the fund, so we will continue to put those dollars into the community. Uh, I will tell you that the greatest need we have seen has been rental assistance, and even a handful, not very many, but just a handful of mortgage assistance, which tells us a great deal about who is being impacted by COVID. It's not just those that would we would look at as being in poverty, but a lot of our Alice families, other families that would have had a little bit more stability, but now all of a sudden have had the rug pulled out from under their feet. So the fund will provide up to $750 in one-time assistance for each household, and it can be split anyway. It can be all for rent, or it can be part rent, part utilities. We are covering, which we don't normally cover, things like internet because we realize that internet is no longer a luxury for Netflix, but a reality for work and for school for all of our families. So again, just making every adjustment and looking at this very, very critically. Um, we did not do this together. We did it with 13 partners and listened to their voices to make sure that we were hearing what their clients were needing from us. And this far, it's worked really well. We, we've been very excited to be able to provide this much support. Thanks, Dominique. That is amazing. I mean, it's an attest to your organization of not only being able to have those resources to reach out to 13 different um, companies, but to be able to quickly pivot so, so quickly and, and provide resources for over 400 um, households. That's amazing. Tony, uh, throughout this COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen our corporate partners step up in a big way. Can you tell us a little bit about how our relationship with these partners has created an impact in our community? Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of our key relationships, obviously, is with the EPB. Um, they recently just launched a fund um, that they were able to partner with TVA and provide a matching opportunity where they would match up to a certain amount for our Restore Hope Fund that we conducted here for COVID-19 families, as obviously Dominique mentioned earlier. Um, so with that, that's just one key relationship of our corporate partners um, that has stepped up to the plate tremendously um, to help during this time. We have several other companies that have said, hey, how can we help? What can we do? Um, not just monetarily, but, but with their volunteer efforts, with helping us with staffing issues. For instance, our 211 call center, um, that is something that uh, obviously is a big deal in our city. And there, are, there have been several community, or, sorry, corporate partners that have stepped up to the plate and said, hey, we have a few volunteers that we could lend you guys to take on some of those calls. So Dominique and her team, while they are, I think they're a team of four, um, they fielded a, a lot of calls in that three month span and they're still fielding a lot of calls. Um, but during that three month span, I think we were averaging probably three to four times more calls than we ever had during that time. So there were several companies that said, Hey, we'll step up to the plate. We'll offer four or five employees, key employees that can help. Um, so again, there's just been many ways that a lot of our corporate partners have stepped up and they have done such a tremendous job in really being united, right? And, and, and truly, you know, truly supporting this community. Thanks, Tony. It's so nice to hear stories about not only our corporate partners, our community partners stepping up in a time of need. I know when the tornadoes, tornadoes came through and EPB had the tremendous effort of putting the, uh, our electric and fiber back together. There's a lot of opportunity, I mean, a lot of 
times where the community came in and just asked to help, wanted to volunteer, wanted to, to help us out. So I can, I can understand where you're coming from with that. Dominique, last year we received the ALICE, which stands for Asset Limited Income Constraint Employee Report. Tell us a little bit about ALICE and some of the key initiatives of the Community Impact Department for our ALICE families and if, ha it, and, if and how any of that has shifted because of COVID-19. Sure, thank you for that question, Kelly. Um, as you identified, ALICE is Asset Limited Income Constrained Employee. It is that group of households that is just above the federal poverty line, which by the way, hasn't changed since the 60s, and that's a whole other conversation there to be had. Um, but these families are just above it. And so what that means is that they are ineligible to receive federal or state support. Um, anything from SNAP or, or food stamps as, as we think of them, um, or child care assistance or, or anything else. So they have to rely fully on themselves. And for the most part, they are, they're, they're doing okay. They are hanging together. They have a roof over their heads and food on the table and a car that's running and gas for the car and the engine blows. And that means that their entire budget for months, maybe even more than a year or longer, is thrown completely out of whack. These families can find themselves homeless because one thing snowballs into another, and all of a sudden they are not able to uh, meet their rent payment, and they start to make very critical decisions between what food they're able to purchase for their families versus paying the electric bill. Um, all of these really harsh realities that they really weren't dealing with in the past. They, they were just getting by okay, and it just took one item. Um, sometimes we call it like a flat tire thing, but it's usually a little bit more than a flat tire, but it'll be something like that that just completely derails this family, and it can be something that's just four or $500 that for many of us does not seem like a derailing incident. For an Alice family, it can be. So the community impact department uh, really focuses a lot um, on this, this demographic, uh, not exclusively. Alice is a priority for us, but it is not exclusively who we focus on with our work. But because our work touches the three pillars of education, health and well-being, and stability, you can see how quickly Alice becomes one of our key priorities, um, particularly with a stability component. So there is a couple of different things that we do. Um, one would be our um, early learning scholarships, which are funded through the BFO process from the city. And what this allows us to do is come alongside families who are having trouble paying for childcare so that both of them or the sole parent can go to work. And we cover a part of the cost and the family covers part of the cost. So this makes it much more affordable for them to be able to get good quality childcare, which if you think about that, that just sets up the family for more success. We know that children who have good quality early uh, childhood education are going to do better in kindergarten, are gonna be reading on level in third grade, they're gonna make the math scores they need in eighth grade, are more likely to graduate ready on time. So something as simple as that quality early childhood education really um, can make a difference in the trajectory of that family. Uh, one of our other initiatives that we have, and this we do in partnership with the Partnership for Children, Families, and Adults, and with Helen Boss McNabb, is our Building Stable Lives program. And this program helps families transition from a crisis situation to a more stability coaching situation. So we have life coaches that will work with them get them through that immediate crisis with the assistance of our 211 specialists, and then continue to work so that they gain the stability they need to, so that hopefully when they have the next flat tire or blown engine, it does not derail the entire family for months at a time. Thank you, Dominique. I remember in our board meeting when we first heard of Alice, well, well I first heard of Alice, um, I was curious, how um, did you guys come about um, knowing that you needed to target that specific group, that, that specific demographic? 
you know, I want to say that we here in Chattanooga can take credit for this, but, but we really can't. Um, we are supported by a tremendous network of United Ways across the country and across the world. And United Way Worldwide, which is our, our overarching uh, umbrella organization. And there was just this understanding that we, across the board, across the country, we are not unique in seeing this need come over again and again and seeing where a family that was stable, um, that maybe came to an agency that we are part of for some more general support, all of a sudden was having a crisis support situation. So it just became clear that, that there was this need. Um, some of you might think of this, uh, the terminology that's been used in the past is working poor, which is really not very good. Um, and this is a much more clear and expressive uh, terminology to use that really quantifies and, and qualifies the effort these families are making. These are not families that are just looking for a handout. These are families that are saying, look, we are, we are doing everything we can and we just need a little bit more support, a little bit more help to get to that level of stability that one small incident does not derail us. Thank you. Tony. The mission of United Way of Greater Chattanooga is to unite people and resources in building a stronger and healthier, healthier community. Tell us how the corporate and community engagement departments works towards fulfilling that mission. Yes, so um, really one of our focuses this year, as we look at Alice, you know, as we look at some of those, those three core values of, of obviously financial stability, health and well-being and education, we are really talking to our companies um, about, about these situations, about these issues, but we're, we're helping them understand it from a standpoint of, hey, these are not their issues, it's our issues. So we're, we're, we're really trying to incorporate that, that language into everything that we do. So that way, whenever we are engaging in community, we are engaging our corporations, they understand that that as a unit, we can collectively help to solve these issues. We may not solve them all, um, but we have a greater opportunity ahead of us if we can all work together. So as we have those conversations, as we talk to them about how we can better strengthen our community, we are getting feedback from them. So when we go into our corporations, we're not just trying to go in as the experts all the time. We're really trying to go in there and discover from them what is it that they are passionate about and how does that tie into the overall mission of united way how does that tie into the whole entire mission of helping and stabilizing the chattanooga and the tennessee valley community so as we do that we are then taking those ideas and, incor and, and incorporating our initiatives and then we are representing that to our co companies and then hopefully we have something that that shapes their corporate social responsibility um, status as well as their efforts and then that also ties into what we need in terms of hey we need the dollars we need the volunteers we need the efforts so that way we can turn around and help the community and strengthen the community because um, every company wants to be CSR compliant every company wants to be stronger in that space so how so what we are doing is trying to make sure that what we are bringing to the table as well as their ideas match up so that way when we present it back out to those corporations and those communities, they understand that we are here for them um, through, through whatever efforts we have, whether, it, you know, whether it's offering a Women United opportunity or, or a volunteer opportunity, um, or it's, it's plainly being able to speak from an educated standpoint when we host our campaign meetings, when we have those leadership meetings within those companies. Seems like an occurring, reoccurring theme with Tony and you, Dominique, as well as the strategicness of United Way of Greater Chattanooga to uh, make sure that our community um, is aligned with um, you all's needs or our needs and, and what you all can provide. This question is for both of you. Tony, I'd like for you to start and, and then Dominique, you can pick up. Um, United Way focuses on education, stability, and health and well being. Share with us how the corporate engagement and community engagement departments work together and why it's so important for the success of United Way? Yeah, well, 
you know, I kind of just touched on it, but, but again, it, it, it's more so around um, how can we make sure that the efforts are valuable, right? You know, I think it's, you know, activity doesn't equal results. Um, I think strategic activity equals results. And so I think it's important when we partner with our companies, whether it is, again, offering our offering a community engagement idea or, or event. It's not just an event, just to have an event so we can walk around and smile at each other. I think it's something that it's adding value. Um, it's, it's, it's adding opportunity. It's adding that necessary conversation. From a community investment standpoint, we have these relationships with our nonprofit partners um, where we are saying to them, hey, hey, from a corporate engagement standpoint, we need your stories. We need your conversations that you are having with the community that we may not have from a corporate standpoint. So that way, we, when we go back into our corporations, the, these employees in these corporations can know my dollar is making a difference. So we're using that data. We're using that information that we're getting from, from the community impact team, from our, from our community investment partners to be able to tell a more um, engaging story. Because if I can get a story from Dominique's team that says, just last week, you know, Joe Smith at EPB gave $20. That $20 was able to pay for a textbook at Howard High School to where that student can then graduate from high school and have a better opportunity to go to college. That story is more compelling than just saying, hey, you know, we increased our giving in in health and well-being this year. That's such a generic statement where that's great, but what exactly did I do with that $20 that you gave me from EPB? And so I think that's how corporate engagement and community investment can continue to work together. And we've done a great job of strengthening that relationship while we get these stories from our community partners. We're able to then transfer those stories to the corporate engagement side. And I think we'll start to see more involvement from our from our corporate partners because we're getting these compelling stories from community impact dominique yeah, just, anything to add? yeah i was just going to say um you know just to to tag into what tony said um we know uh and when i say we i don't mean united way i mean every agency that is working in social services community in general understands that outputs don't equal outcomes, right? So just a lot of activity doesn't necessarily produce the outcomes that we understand our community needs. Um, so our community investment team works very closely with our partners to make sure that we are getting reporting not just on the outputs, but on those outcomes and getting those stories, like Tony said. So for example, with Restore Hope, one of the first families that applied was a grandmother who's raising a couple of grandchildren and had worked in the hospitality industry for 20 plus years for a hotel. And she'd been furloughed and she'd been told, you're eligible for rehire the minute we're able to get our numbers back up, we'll bring you back on. But how does she put food on the table in the meantime? How does she pay her electric bill? How does she pay her rent? So being able to tell the story of that grandmother is much more impacting than if I just say, well, we helped 486 families, that's great but now you've got a visual of an actual family and, and how they were impacted. Um, so that's one big way that we do support each other's work. Um, I would say that Tony's team supports community investment completely. We couldn't do anything without Tony's team because they are the ones that uh, raise the dollars that make the work possible. And one other way that we work very closely together is, the, is part of community investment. So we have several people that work on data, uh, most notably Dr. Eileen Rayburg. And she looks at data both as the driving force for the work and as the resulting uh, reporting for the work. So when Tony's team goes out to talk to a corporation, she is able to provide data that is very granular about where the needs are in the community um, and how best to get those addressed. And then on the back side of that, able to provide data that shows the impact of the work that's been done. So United Way is very data driven, 
um, and data responsive. So we, we're looking at the data on the front end and then also on the back end. Thank you. One second, lost the earplug. Um, just for you all that are on the call, I just want to let you know we have three more questions. Um, so if you have um, any additional questions for the panelists, go ahead and send those in. So Dominique, can you tell us about some important impact programs internally at United Way through your community investment process and with local nonprofits? Um, specifically share with us about some of the exciting work that the 39 partners agencies have been able to accomplish through the funds that United Way provides. Sure, thank you, Kelly. Um, so I talked a little bit about our BSL or Building Stable Lives work, and I talked a little bit about our early learning scholarships, and that is um, the internal work that United Way does through partners. But as you alluded to, we do have 29 agencies that we have been partnering with, some for many, many years, and there are lots of different uh, demographics they touch. So we, we work everything from um, domestic abuse to substance abuse to uh, early childhood to a therapeutic preschool, um, support for those with disabilities, um, elderly, just about any demographic that you can imagine. There are programs that are supported by United Way in the community. One of the things we started doing uh, two years ago, we're, we're just coming into our our second year of this is adjusting our community investment model. So how we put dollars into the community through these agencies. And the idea behind this is to ensure that the agencies are working more collaboratively. So everybody is not trying to serve, solve world hunger in you know, five different silos where if they all came together, we could do a lot more, right? Um, so it's, it's an interest in making sure that there's a lot more collaboration and communication among the agencies in the community so that we can drive deeper impact. And one of the things that we have been able to see through this is uh, there is a partnership between the Northside Neighborhood House and Helen Ross McNabb, and it's called Community in Schools, and it's in four schools, which is uh, Red Bank, Red Bank High, Hickson Middle, and um, they're looking at one in Saudi Daisy as well, and they have not identified the fourth one yet. But the one that is most active at this moment is the one in Red Bank High. And what that looks like uh, realistically is there are after school opportunities available to the students. There is parental engagement opportunities there and work that is being done to engage the parents with the schools, with the students. There is the ability to identify and address mental health issues that can end up driving into other issues like sometimes uh, substance abuse or, or other negative behaviors can come from mental health issues that are not properly addressed. And so working together, these two agencies are really making a change and an impact in that community. And to that end, um, United Way's 211 program this year started a um, 211 kiosk, which is, uh, imagine it like a really large iPad that is mounted uh, securely and you're able to access all of the resources in the community that you might be able to access or you would be able to access if you were calling 211, but this way you're able to navigate it on your own. Um, this has been sponsored by Blue Care. Uh, the first one went into Red Bank High, and we've already seen, well, up until COVID, uh, a lot of engagement by the students and the parents coming in. So we train school administrators, school faculty, school staff as to how to use this uh, kiosk really well, and they in turn can then help families navigate it. Um, what it does is it really empowers the individuals in the households to seek out their own opportunities and, and their own solutions rather than relying on someone else. So it's a very empowering opportunity. And because it's right in the community where they already are, the students are already going to school, the parents are coming into the school for a different variety of reasons, they're able to access this very directly. Um, so just a way of all of these collaborative things coming together um, at Red Bank High to really impact the students and the families in that community. 
thank you, Dominique. A lot of good information. I know when EPD does their annual campaign, one of those agencies normally comes and tells us a story about their particular group uh, to um, uh, just not only inform us, but it also, I feel like, encourages us to give because not only do you get to put a face with that particular agency, but there's a story behind it as well. Tony, outside of workplaces, getting involved with United Way through giving and engagement groups, give us an example of how workplaces have been able to partner with United Way to champion an initiative of the impact department. Yes, so um, there have been several companies um, that have started their own internal um, community impact opportunities for their employees. Um, for instance, I know Tennessee Valley Federal Credit Union, they do several things with their employees that are, that were, that was an idea birthed out of what community impact has done in terms of reaching out to the nonprofit partners themselves um, and developing those key relationships with those community partners. A lot of our corporations already have strong ties to some of our community partners because of the relationship of United Way convening them in the past. So um, that's been very helpful. For instance, you know, our relationship with the YMCA where they do these meals for these kids. There's several accounting firms that they go and volunteer on their own time to go and actually make those connections and build those relationships with that community partner to make those lunches for those students during the summertime. Um, that's just one key partnership that we see that is happening on a, on a regular basis where because of the work of community impact, providing these numbers, you know, providing these figures, providing these, these stories, then these companies will say to themselves, well, Hey, why don't we go directly to this community partner and see how we can help them see how we can help them uh, grow. Um, there's another accounting firm, actually uh, Elliot Davis, they have taken on some of the mentoring collective, which is another, or which is another sub organization of United Way that offers mentoring opportunities for students in Hamilton County, and they partner them with individuals within, within our corporations. Well, Elliot Davis said, hey, we would love to have several of these kids come in once a month where we could show them what we do and, and, and how we do it and maybe give them some inspiration for something that they want to do in the future. Um, so that's just, that's just a few ways that our corporate partners have taken on what Community Impact has, has, has provided for all these years and being able to say, hey, let's, let's do more than just give money. Um, let's, let's truly try to make some more impact um, you know, as we go forward. Thank you, Tony. Um, this is for both of you, um, Dominique, if you start and um, Tony, you can follow up as necessary. Um, with so many good causes and organizations in Chattanooga, why would you encourage individuals to give and support United Way? The simple answer is it's because it's a united approach. And I know that sounds simplistic, but uh, you will hear me say this in response to uh, various different questions. While we are working in silos, we are not going to really be able to address the root causes for the systemic problems that we see in our community and in communities across the country. If we do not work collaboratively and in a united way, we're not going to be able to really tackle those well and move the needle on those things. Um, I'll give you a quick example. So uh, last year, um, we were having a community roundtable with many of our partners and one of the needs that was raised uh, by the partnership was, you know, we have uh, women that want to exit abusive situations, but they won't leave because of family pet. And you're like, what do you mean a family pet? Well, they don't want to add trauma to their children by their children losing a pet. And sometimes they're concerned that the pet will also experience um, trauma if it's left in the home. And so McKamey said, well, wait a minute, we can fix that problem for you. We can board those pets until the family gets stable home housing, and then they can come and get their pets back. And all of a sudden, that removed a barrier that was really stopping some women from making that really critical decision of getting to safety for themselves and their children. Um, 
that's what collaboration looks like. It's not necessarily everybody that's working on a specific thing working together. It can be, but it can also be the different agencies that are able to tackle uh, different problems from, a, from different angles. And so therefore they can diffuse the situation and resolve the situation much quicker. Uh, so I would say that that is uniquely what United Way can bring to the table. Uh, we are conveners, we accelerate the work. And by bringing the community voice and agencies and corporations all together to have these conversations, then we can really move the needle on these issues. I would say um, very similar, you know, to me, United Way gives individuals within the workplace, um, as well as out in the community, the unique opportunity to see how corporations and the community can partner together. Um, and as you donate your time, your talents and your treasure to United Way, you know that those dollars are directly impacting the community. You know, to me, you know, a lot of people say internally that campaign is what makes the engine go uh, for United Way. To me, impact is the engine that makes you know, United Way go because though we can raise, you know, whatever, $11 million, if we don't turn around and use those dollars to impact the community, then we've just raised a ton of money just to say we raised a ton of money. But to me, when we can talk about the impact that is being made through our community partners, and we can encourage our corporate partners to tell their stories of how they were impacted by the by the impact that was made in the community, then we're winning as a community. We're winning as a city because we are putting forth the effort that is necessary to truly affect change. You know, uh, obviously uh, earlier it was mentioned that 39% of our community right now is considered Alice families. And that was actually pre COVID. So we don't even know what the, what those numbers are going to be right now. But to me, that's why I would want to give to United Way if I wasn't working for United Way, because I know that there are community members, there are people that, that I may work with that work right alongside of me that may be considered an Alice family. And if I know that my dollars or, or my time or my, or my efforts can be given to help that person, then I think that's encouraging to know as United Way is the one who is leading the charge. And our, and, our, and our corporate partners and our community partners are coming right alongside of us, that to me is a huge reason and a great reason to say, you know what, sign me up. Um, so so as, we, as we continue this fight for better, um, as we continue to, to, to work towards change and we work towards seeing growth, there's really no better organization than United Way to, to funnel our efforts through because we know that it's going to get done. That's great. Well, I'm so, <laughs> you got me. Uh, uh, you guys ab absolutely have already been committed and, and um, this information that you've shared today has made that commitment even stronger. Um, we are about to conclude uh, this talk, but um, I wanted to give people a couple more minutes to send in any questions if you have. I have a couple of questions um, already submitted that I'll start here in a second, but I just wanted to say um, again, thank you to both of our panelists and, and some of the things that have stuck out to me is Tony, when you said that you guys listen to your cor corporate partners and then come back internally and um, use that information to help shape your mission and, and goals. And Dominique, when you told us a little bit about yourself and how you got started, um, when you said that um, why you, the reasons why you chose United Way was because it was a, an agency that could have the, a greater impact because of um, the different resources and, that it can touch. And, uh, those two things really stood out to me. Uh, so both of you, um, as we've seen the needs of the community changing, and especially with things slowly opening back, in, opening back up, how do you see the United Way transitioning to meet those new needs? Well, um, well, you know, hopefully we are, uh, 
watching the news and, and seeing when we need to open back up because I, obviously we're starting to see those numbers rise again. So, but you know, one of the things we're doing from a corporate standpoint is really a lot of these, right? Is a lot of virtual meetings where we are trying to keep our corporations engaged as much as possible. You know, emails are great and, and being able to, to talk to people via email is awesome. But sometimes still being able to see somebody, even though it's through a screen, is so much more helpful. So right now we are in the midst of our CEO calls where we are contacting our corporations, talking to the CEOs, uh, again, keeping them informed, top of mind of what we are working on. Because it's real easy in an environment like this, when you're separated from people physically, to disconnect in so many ways. Um, so we're trying to keep the language top of mind of Alice of our kiosk, of our community investment process, so that these corporations know we are still working. We are still trying to stay on the front lines of everything is trying to stay ahead, especially right now with what's going on from a social justice standpoint. We are shifting a lot of our language and a lot of our efforts to have those hard conversations with corporations as we have them. So every CEO call, we are having those discussions on hearing from, hearing from that CEO, what is your company doing to, to talk about social, social justice? What is your company doing to make sure there's racial equity? Um, and then again, going back to the drawing board and then representing that information to them to say, well, here are some ideas that we have from another corporation that you may want to use for your corporation. Um, again, because as these, as these issues start to pop up, we don't need to just continue to just wait. We also need to get creative and ahead of the game to make sure that our corporations understand that each and every employee that they have is passionate about something. We want to make sure that we have a solution to those passions and to help them going forward. Dominique, do you have anything to add? As, as we are, well, I was going to say, as we are moving into a more of a um, rebuilding of, of our economy and, and all of that, but of course, we, we really don't know that yet um, for what that's going to look like, uh, what post-COVID is going to look like, and, and when post-COVID is going to be. So we are still focused very much on providing the support and assistance that families need as a bridge to get them through to the next stage. Um, but we're also looking at how we help them then get to the level of stability again that they need to be at so that they're not necessarily looking for assistance on a monthly or quarterly basis. Um, there's a lot of work involved with that. Um, our Building Stable Lives program, we are very excited to, to have the possibility of expanding it. Um, we anticipate hearing something positive about some grants um, in the not too distant future, which would allow us to serve more households in that manner. Um, it also looks like our early education work uh, shifting a little bit. We had received a grant, for example, that would allow uh, us to make smaller grants to individual uh, child care centers so they could improve and add seats to their uh, center so more children could, could be, um, uh, could, I'm sorry, forgive me, so that more children could be there. Um, so adding capacity of quality seats. Uh, when COVID really came to bear, uh, and a lot of the child care centers had to close, um, and many of them uh, do not have the ability to help their staff continue going forward. Um, many of those uh, staff applied for like unemployment, for example. And the concern has been all along that we are going to lose many quality childcare seats. And so there's an estimation, which we don't know for sure what that's gonna look like, but it's estimated that 44% of the quality early childhood seats are gonna be lost in Tennessee. Um, by the time we get through COVID. And there was already a huge shortage of childcare. And so what we looked at and what our team looked at together with the Early Matters Coalition was what can be done to help shore that up a little bit so that there is 
less chance of a loss. And so some of those dollars that were grant dollars, we went back to the foundation and Early Matters worked together and all of that shifted so that we were able to provide support to the centers directly so that they could meet their bills and their expenses so that they could keep their doors open and their staff would not have to go on unemployment and then potentially not come back. There's already a shortage of early childhood um, care, care workers. So it's, it's a variety of different things that we are looking at and as different situations present themselves, how do we pivot and what shifts do we need to make? And so we're looking forward to those and I think as much as we believe we know what some of those pivots are gonna be until we are sort of on the other side and into a, a true new normal, we're not gonna know what all of those shifts are, are gonna be yet. Thank you. Uh, Dominique, I believe we have a question from Shana for you. I'm pulling up. I'm sorry, it, I'm not seeing it. Somehow it's Dana, not showing. Think, Dana, I think you're muted. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm still figuring out the Zoom thing. Um, in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge facing our community as a whole? You know, I, I've been asked this question a lot of times and I, I tend to come back to the same thing and it's that we have to work together. Um, depending on who I'm speaking with and, and I will say it in different ways, but um, sometimes I'll say we, we need to leave the egos at the door. Um, and the egos can be a personal thing. It can be a corporate thing. It can be an agency thing. Um, we need to stop thinking that we are going to solve X, Y, or Z problem as an agency, as a corporation, as an individual, as even as a governmental entity. No one sector can resolve it by themselves. So if we really do not work in conjunction and collaboratively and really transparently and not be concerned about who is getting the credit for having solved world hunger, it is, wow, we solved world hunger altogether. Um, that's an extreme example, but, but that's really the truth. If we do not work transparently and in a united way with each other all across the different sectors, we're not going to resolve our root cause issues. And I think that that is our biggest challenge, um, that sometimes we allow our egos or our desire to be the ones who get the credit for finding the solution and implementing it to get in the way of really good work. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, for such an honest answer. Well, I have one last question for um, Tony. And um, while he's finishing that answer up, if you guys get in one more, um, that'll be great. Um, but if not, we know that you guys got some, got some good information here. Tony, are there any new initiatives that you are particularly excited about at United Way? Yes. Um, th this focus on Alice is, is to me, is huge. Um, just as Dominique pointed to earlier, as, as the sales team, if you will, for United Way, we have a responsibility to go and sell to our employee campaign uh, folks what it is that we need them to buy, which is donate their, t you know, donate their dollars. And so for, for years in the past, we haven't had a specific story to tell we've just always spoke from a generic standpoint and hope that they would continue to give. Well, last year alone, we saw our designations go up tremendously because people want to know where their dollars are going. It's not enough to just say, Hey, give to United way anymore where people can just, you know, if they wanted to, they could just give directly to that community partner as opposed to going through United way. So it's, it's imperative for us as an organization that we have these specific stories. And again, I cannot stress, enough how important and how valuable Dominique and her team have, have been for us in giving us these key stories where we can go back and tell that story again, as I mentioned earlier about that Howard High School student. That's something tangible, right? We all want tangible. You know, we don't go to the store 
Uh, we don't go to Hamilton Place Mall and buy a fake shirt, you know, a, a uh, you know, an imaginary T-shirt. We go to buy a real T-shirt. And when somebody, as I am selling something, um, as I am selling these stories, I need to be able to tell something that's tangibly happening in our community. Just as a story that Dominique shared earlier, you know, about the grandmother that is being laid off and, 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 and you know, what have you. That's a tangible story that me, when I can pull on the touch, you know, on the heartstrings of somebody's heart, I can pull on that by saying there is a person in our community and here is the story. Each and every person on this call, if they were to hear that story, though they may not give right away, their heart would be moved in that direction to at least think about it. And to me, that's what's most exciting about this new strategy that we're doing is it's more about telling the stories as opposed to just talking about United Way. Let's talk about the stories and let, let, let's let United Way go to the background and let's share the stories. That way, some people will be more compelled to say, man, I really have to give more. Yeah, I really need to volunteer more. I really need to use what I have and be a blessing to somebody else. You know, and the more we do that, then the more we, you know, then I, then I should say, then the less we need to talk about United Way and the more we can just say, here's the stories, guys, you choose what you want to give towards. And the more we can do that, um, then hopefully one day, um, just as our CEO, Leslie, always says, hopefully one day on the front, front page of the Times Free Press, it can say United Way closed this doors because every need in the community was met. Um, but until then, we all have work to do. Um, and so using these Alice examples is, is, is what I'm most excited about because it helps us to do our work more effectively. Thank you, Tony, well said. You got me ready to pass the collection plate now. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, end this segment um, of our uh, event and I'll pass it over to Ann Bradshaw, who is the president of Women United. Ann? Me unmute. Thank you so much for leading the panel, Kelly. And um, Tony and Dominique, we really, really appreciate your time and your expertise and all the information you gave us. It helps so much to know firsthand the impacts of, of everything that United Way does. The stories, just like you said, Tony. Um, it, you know, it, the creation of the Restore Hope Fund is one of those, is one of the many reasons I love United Way so much. I personally, like so many people, as soon as um, the COVID pandemic hit, you kind of realize, you're like, wait a second, what's gonna happen to our economy and what's gonna happen to all these people um, it, that are high risk and vulnerable and the children who don't get their lunches at school. But I wasn't in a position to go out and volunteer myself. I have an elderly mother-in-law living with me. I didn't want to be exposed, but I wanted to do something. And of course, United Way was the one very early on who gave me that option to do something. And, and I, could, I could give with the confidence of knowing that the funds were going to get to the right places and they're, they were going to make an impact. So I think the Restore Hope Fund is just such a perfect example of how United Way convenes, how it acts, and how it impacts our community. Um, so it's, um, that, that was one reason and one very good example of, of why um, I've wanted to be so involved with this organization. Um, it really is a hub in this community to convene and to, and to find all the assets and get them together and get them to the right place, the right places to make the impact in our community. Um, again, using measurable data, but with a heart and um, with great goals to make the impact and to, um, like Dominique said, to, to convene and to, and to um, use the resources so that people aren't duplicating efforts. That's such a huge part of it as well. So that's a little bit about why I love this organization so much and, and wanted to be involved more and 
having a um, an affinity group of women just spoke to me because I know we can get a lot done. <laughs> so that's why Women United appealed to me so much and trying to get this off the ground and um, have it be such um, an important part with in a, an important group within United Way. Um, so that's just a little bit about about what I what I love about United Way, but so that we can let everybody get back to your day. Just want y'all to remember that you'll be receiving a follow up from Mary Catherine in an email to explain a little bit more about Women United and how to get plugged in. And also I think there'll be a survey about the chat in that follow up as well. If y'all don't mind taking a little time to finish that. And I think that's everything. Mary Catherine, can you think of anything else? That's it. Thank y'all so much for attending. We appreciate it. Tony, Dominique, and Kelly, thank you um, for your time and for joining us for this hour. And um, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks.